Okay, I'm joining. We're good. Diddy, right. if you ask me a question as I hit the hangout button. I, yeah, if you're not going to have your video on, if we're doing a roll call, I maybe try to use the little raised hand option if um, if you are in favor. Okay. Or, or just unmute yourself. I'll, I'll just unmute and speak. Yeah. Um, and I apologize. I just realized I don't have the agenda up. So, um, okay. All right. Do we, um, Nancy, do you want to do the um, public input? Yes, I will. Uh, the first public input session is a 15-minute session with each person having no longer than three minutes in which to make a statement, but a second public input session may be held at the end of the meeting if allowed by the board chair. The speaker will give his, her uh, name, address, and reason for speaking. Public input is designated for district residents, but the board chair may grant non-residents the opportunity to address the board. Statements concerning subject matter that falls under the law regarding executive sections, for example, matters involving personnel, cannot be made during public input. And there should be a link that you click on to send uh, your questions or comments to the board. Do we have any input, Sue? Unmute, unmute, here I am. Yes, we have two um, pieces of public input. The first is from Jen England from North Berwick. And she asks, or, or it's a statement actually. Well, there's a question too. Will the high school be extending its remote learning schedule? York County positivity rates are frightening. The new COVID-19 variant is in New England and many of our district families have struggled with positive cases over the break. I am hoping the board makes the safest possible decision for teachers, students, and families as we enter what scientists and doctors are describing as the darkest period of the virus. Thank you. And our second public input is from Jenica Osborne, also of North Berwick. I have concerns about our students returning to school next week in the hybrid model due to the recent holiday vacation uptick in cases and family visits. We were one of the families affected by the 1215 close contact exposure at Noble Middle School and spent 10 days through the holidays in quarantine. I request that we delay the return to school and continue with the red model until at least um, January 18th week. Thank you. So that is our public input. Um, we actually have the return to school and, you know, return to the hybrid model on our agenda. So we can address that then if you'd like. I think that makes sense. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm going back and forth between two computers here. Um, okay, so the minutes of December 17th. I'm not having a lot of success. Does anybody have any comments? No, not. Can we get a motion to accept those? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes of the meeting. And Sue, were you just um, correcting the date on that? Yep, I just corrected the top. Yep. Okay. This this is Joanne making the motion. I gotcha. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. This is Linda. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Who? Uh, I'm not in Spain. I didn't. I wasn't there. Okay. 
Oh, and I think, was there somebody else not there? I also will abstain. Okay, okay thank you. And there was one other, I thought there was one other person not there. Rita? It was me. Yeah, sorry. So I abstain yeah. as well. Okay, so I think everyone else in favor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, student representative to the board. If we could, before we um, provide that update, if we could add a number nine um, to the agenda, and that would be the addendum to the support staff contract to allow bus monitors um, to be part of that contract. If we could add that as number nine. Okay. Thank you. Um, just an update on the student representatives to the board. We have a few students that we are talking to at the high school. And um, by our next meeting, we will likely have um, new members from our student body representing the, being representative on the board. Excellent. Um, I look forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, budget timeline. We all have a link. And Denise is here, Van Campen, and um, we've talked about this timeline at the Facilities and Finance Committee. It's pretty similar to in the past, but we'll have Denise kind of walk through it. Hi, everybody. Okay, so again, as Audra said, this is similar to prior years. There are a couple minor changes that we think will improve the flow a little bit. Um, but basically, we had our kickoff meeting in September uh, with a budget meeting where we looked, we talked about the budget in general and did some goal setting. Um, we had presentations for each cost center with Audra, Sue, and me. Um, the end of November and beginning of December. So we have had the opportunity to hear kind of preliminary conversations about where people are and what they're needing. Um, the month of January uh, is the time for me to finalize, to enter all of the data into the software, to project salaries, do all of those things. The month of January is where the meat of the budget gets put together. Um, February 1st, we are um, supposed to receive state subsidy information. As of the business state business manager meeting today, they have said that they are still on track to meet that deadline. Um, they said barring unforeseen circumstances, but who knows what that is. <laughs> um, once we receive the subsidy information on February 1st, over the next 10 days or so, we have administrative meetings to firm up some plans for the budget. And we finalize the budget Friday, February 12th. That will give us approximately a week to get all of the budgets printed, collated and into binders so that we can get those to the board members on the 19th of February. Um, the week of February 22nd, Administrator presentations will happen to the Facilities and Finance Subcommittee. Um, March 4th, which is um, a regularly scheduled meeting, it's the first uh, Thursday of March, um, Audra will present the Fiscal 22 budget to the Board of Directors, and we will follow with a budget workshop. Um, and that's where we have the Q&A with all of the administrators so that you can ask questions that you have. Um, we'll have to see what that looks like uh, this year as far as remote or in person, but we will make sure to have that opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, let's see, the next, um, what we then did, you'll see the month of March, pretty much from March 11th, Thursday, March 11th, through Thursday, April 8th. Those are our meetings to talk about um, big budget items to answer questions you might have. Um, we put, if you'll notice, some of them say if needed next to them. Um, at the, at, we are going to be able to determine at a certain point whether we want to meet every week or whether every other week is, is enough for what you need. We'll, we'll kind of play that as we go, but it's almost like a save the date just in case we need them. 
We then move to the final draft. Again, the final draft of the budget has to be done by Thursday, April 8th. Um, we send then send the information to the attorneys. We sign the budget warrants on Thursday, April 15th. Um, we have our budget meeting on May 20th and our referendum on June 8th. So it's pretty much similar to last year. We The changes we made largely, we're not doing administrator presentations during the week of February break. Um, we had talked about it and we did, we felt it was important for the administrators and board members and everyone to actually get a break this year. So we've kind of moved it out a little bit. It also gives us more time to um, take the information with state subsidy and work with a final budget. And that's primarily the change. Does anybody have any questions? I will just say that the timeline stressed me out quite a bit when I first looked at it because I thought those were all things that I had to do. Oh. <laughs> you know, so binders, I didn't know where, yeah, but I'm good. It, it's happened for the last couple of years, so I, I get over it pretty quickly. Okay. <laughs> you need a highlighter and just highlight the things that you have to do and not everything else. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else have questions or anything on that timeline? So I will I will share. I have asked been asked by uh, at least one town clerk about dates as far as uh, budget meeting and referendum. So tomorrow I will share with the three towns that those are our anticipated dates, um, and then I will let them know if with that changes, we'll let them know. I mean, who knows where things will be then, but I assume we should be planning for either in-person or virtual, just in case. And I, I would also, I would suggest um, maybe Audra and Sue or one or the other, whatever, to kind of reach out to the town select boards maybe ahead of time and ask to come and give them information because there's a lot of stuff flying around out there that maybe we can, you know, stop right now about money and all that stuff in the school. So I'm just wondering if we give them a, like an abbreviated presentation or something, if, if that would be helpful. I think that's a great idea. Um, we could also reach out to them. And if there's one of our board meetings in particular that we're really going to be covering a lot, invite them to join that. Um, but I do, I agree completely, Nancy, that reaching out to those, the three towns is imperative. Okay. All right. Backpack donation. Sure. We've got quite a few donations between the backpack and school nutrition. So um, Jacqueline and Sean Doherty for $500 for the backpack program. Omni Services, $2,000 to the backpack program. Kip Talon, who um, is an employee of our district, works in our um, one of our programs in our district, who's also a resident in Lebanon, I believe she still is. Um, she and her family have donated $1,253 and several boxes of food that they um, collected and raised during their light show display that they have annually. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Huh. And then for, for school nutrition, we have the Raymond and Ella Claire Gosselin Foundation for $2,000 and then Harvest Goddess for $2,000. Wow. Good stuff. Are those, are those last two local? I think the... Har yeah, Harvest the, Goddess is in Lebanon. I, I was going to say that, and I'm not sure about the the first one. I'm not sure how local that local yeah. is. Can you do me a favor, Audra? Can you just put those in an email? Because um, sure. I don't, I don't, unless I missed it, I don't think they're, yeah, if you could, I'd love, oh, are they, are they all here? No, just this. Well, we'll, and I'll put them in the minutes of the meeting. Yeah, it would be great. Sure. We, we keep getting, um, you know, they keep rolling in, which is a good thing, but some of them haven't made the formal agenda. Yeah. No, it's great. I, I'd like to, I'd like to 
at least check out those, especially the businesses. Yes, great. All right, so we do need a motion on those. Can we accept them all together? We can. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll make the motion that we accept all of the donations to the school nutrition and to the backpack program. This is Nancy. Second. Somebody want a second? I'll second. A second. All in favor? I'm in favor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, updates. Sure. So we have a couple of updates to share. Uh, Susan Macri's here because we did have a question come up at our last meeting about special education services, especially for students who are fully remote. Um, so Susan's here to kind of give us an, an overview of how services are being provided for all of our K-12 students and answer any additional questions that may have come up. So, um, hi everybody, first of all, I, Happy New Year. I hope you're all healthy. Um, so with special education, one of the things that I continue to emphasize and, and just believe is so important is that we make our decisions individually and not, not paint with a broad brush and say a particular program can come in or certain students can come in based on a profile, but make those decisions individually. In terms of our remote, our, our families who have chosen remote, we respect their choice. Um, we emphasize that we feel that special ed services can best be provided in person. Um, that being said, I think our teachers are doing a really good job of providing services remotely to our students at um, the elementary level. And um, actually, actually at all levels, our special ed teachers initially chose to provide services to the students who are on their caseload rather than making one case manager um, strictly remote. We had a couple of case managers whose caseloads became a little bit overwhelming. And so we have done some shifting. Um, we hired a tutor to, to meet the needs of some of our media kids in their remote learning. And in terms of participation, um, any student who is appropriately participating in their regular ed programming is also participating very appropriately in their special ed programming. We have some students who are better participants in their special ed programming than they are in their regular ed programming. And we do have some students who um, are, are not participating um, or not adequately participating. We continue to do what um, is being done by the buildings. We reach out to our families. We've done some home visits. Um, we're doing everything we can to try to engage those remote students who are not engaged. Um, it feels a little bit helpless at times. We can't reach into their houses and, and, and make them sit in front of their computers. In terms of those students who have our most, our students with the most significant impairments, I have been amazed at what our case managers are doing for those families. They meet with parents and explain what needs to be done. They deliver packets to the families and then the parents work to implement the programming in the home. Um, so that, that has been extremely impressive to see what they're doing um, in terms of assisting families who have chosen remote whose children can't participate, who are not able to participate remotely. Are there any questions? Did I answer the question um, that was on the table? I think it's helpful to get that update and your perspective at this point in the year. And one of the other things that we're doing, we did have a parent, we've, we've had parent group meetings for the last, I think, five years or so um, with variable attendance. We had a virtual parent group meeting and we had great attendance. We probably had about 40 parents who participated. Um, it was helpful to them um, just to feel some support. So that was, 
Um, that was great to see. I was a little bit surprised. We did it kind of as an open house drop in between, I think it, it was either four to six or five to seven. Um, and we were just about to say, it looks like we're done and another parent popped in. Um, so that was, that was really helpful. Um, so we're doing what we can to stay in touch with parents. We have, as I think you know, a Facebook page, we have our own website, and we are constantly updating that with helpful hints for parents. Um, more parent support groups seem to have popped up in the area, making sure parents are aware of those, and just letting parents know that if they have concerns, to please call us. We don't know if they have a concern unless they let us know. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, uh, Susan. I was wondering, um, this summer, um, is there going to be additional programming for the, the students? Because you know, every student, kids, mm -hmm. that need the additional supports. Are we going to have um, more things offered for them in the summer? So what we're looking at and the advice we're getting is to continue to have our traditional ESY program, which, ad which addresses concern about regression future regression. And then looking at having what we'll call probably a COVID recovery program and look at how we can meet kids' needs. I, I really anticipate having the vast majority of our special ed kids in this summer. And again, we, we really need to differentiate between the ESY and the COVID recovery. And some kids may have both. Susan, what does ESY stand for? Extended school year. Okay. And that, again, is a, a decision that's made individually by the IEP team to determine if a child needs programming through the summer in order to benefit from what they've done during the school year and not regress. Thank you. And that's, that is weighing heavily on our minds. We're about to put out a survey to staff to see who might be interested in working. I think that's going to be the biggest hurdle is to make sure that we can find adequate um, staff so that we can provide the programming. And hopefully we'll be in person. Otherwise, it's not going to be all that helpful. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions for Susan? All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so our next um, guest <laughs> is um, Brenda Cravens. So I I think we shared with you last night that we did have um, someone in transportation test positive. So we've kind of asked we've asked Brenda to come in and just share an update with us because it did impact not just one little piece. Um, there's a few other little moving targets there uh, that Brenda's worked on. So, Brenda? Hi. Um, yes, we've been uh, transporting vocational students um, this past week. And we had a driver who tested positive And two other drivers spent some time in between pick up and drop off uh, in his presence. So we are down three drivers for Monday. Um, that's on top of the a couple of others that we've been covering anyway. Um, but we have been able to figure out how to cover that. So I think we're gonna be okay for school next week. Um, we've been getting a few more um, students uh, to register for hybrid learning and needing a ride. Um, we're working on that tomorrow a little bit. We had um, eight uh, new ones today and we were only able to um, load one of them onto a bus. Uh, the other bus, the other students, the buses that they need are full at this time. So we're going to work on that tomorrow um, to try to see what we can do um, to move and shift and get everybody a ride that needs one. So, any questions? Uh, this is going to 
kind of come to you, but I, it might be, um, Audra, you might be dealing with it later in the agenda, but um, I was, one of my questions was going to be, how are we looking for second semester numbers of kids making changes? So I don't know if we want to, if we're going to get to that, but I assume a huge part of that is going to be transportation. So, um, <coughs> so that is my question, but we might be answering that later. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, we can only do the best we can do. Um, we did have a, a driver leave us. And so we sort of absorbed that run. We pushed students from that bus route out into other bus routes. Um, but I think uh, once we're back to being fully staffed and, and we don't, hopefully we don't have any more cases where we're losing a lot of people at one time, we can add that bus route back in and hopefully make some room for those other students. Um, the drivers have been really great. They've been very cooperative about taking on extra kiddos that, that um, you know, don't actually go on their routes. Um, yeah, they've, they've just all been really, really great. And my team's been really great in the office as well. So we're going to get as many as we can into school. Okay. Thank you. And definitely a, a huge appreciation and thank you to Brenda because uh, it was a little, a little, it gave us a little pause yesterday when we <laughs> talked about how many um, bus drivers we may um, be short for Monday and how that could potentially impact us. But um, very big appreciation for that work. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Denise, I guess we can start with with that question that you had about um, the the switch, if you will. All of our schools, um, likely on likely tomorrow, our schools will be sending not notices home to to families, just an update on the new year and how things are going. And in there, there's going to be a place that the um, that it says that if you have questions or concerns about your child's um, instructional model, please contact your child's teacher or or the administrator of the building to talk about alternatives or problem solving. Um, so that's how we're handling any questions that have come up um, to the schools about we want to go from remote to hybrid or hybrid to remote. And in those letters, there's also going to be some some cutoff notification times so that we do have time to make changes to the bus if we need to make changes for busing and, di and different parts, pieces like that. So those letters, as yeah, I said, will be going out. I would just make sure that that was pretty well highlighted in that letter because I know there's a lot of people, I assume that you've probably, that the school administrators have heard from most people who want to switch i would i would assume that's the case but um in case there are people who know that it's sort of sometime in january and are holding back i would just make sure that in that communication it was um uh, you know pretty clear that this was the, how we're handling um a switch from one model to another right and the letters look good you know we've looked through those letters and um certainly you know, we, they're encouraging communication and have it being contacted. So yes, but we will certainly make sure that those all go out in a timely manner and that we can make changes. Um, and we may have to be creative with how we, we make changes, um, but we do will you, certainly do so. From what you've heard from people mm -hmm. sort of lately, do you, um, I know that at one point at least the number of kids going who wanted to go remote was actually more of an issue because of teachers but then probably transportation is an issue the other way do you have any sense of how much um movement you might expect that we'll see i think there are little pockets in different towns um i think we have a pulse on some of the numbers right now and for some schools it's even switches it's like three want to three want to go out for remote, but three have expressed an interest in coming back to school now that they've seen how things are going in school. In other areas, it's a little more lopsided and just trying to, to figure that balance out, you know, more want to come in from remote than want to go out for remote at this point in time. Um, 
you know, the elementary schools are a little harder with spacing than at the high school based on their model of use the use of technology so that they can have a lot of students remotely on those in-person days um, coming into the classroom remotely for that, those lessons. Um, so really, it's going to be the elementary schools that if we have a lot of students that are going to um, want to come in in person, that we're going to really need to look at logistically how we can manage the health you know, the, the guidelines of the the four to six feet or three to six feet distance, that's going to be, those are going to be the pieces. Yeah, because what one thing that concerns me is the size of some of the remote classes right now. Right. Um, do you have a backup plan or something in the back of your head? Like, because like 25 kids is too many in a remote we, class or whatever. We do have, oh. some, we do have some thoughts and... Okay it's hard to kind of go in one direction with those thoughts until we actually know what those numbers look like. Right. And it's all grades, yeah. right. 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 Nancy, I was on a call today. We, we had a seminar this afternoon, a webinar, and I was on a call with the RSU six folks, which is Searsport area. Their remote um, elementary, one teacher, K to five, 50 kids. Oh my goodness. Right. She's got some support. She has a, an ed tech or two, I think they told me. But yeah, so wow. I was like, oh, we are doing well. Comp you know what I mean? So okay. yeah. I'm going to send I'm going to send anybody up there to say, hey, check that one out. <laughs> it's not I'm not saying it's a good problem. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Right. And here's a, a question, you know, back in the day, the um, like often parents would volunteer in a classroom. Is there any opportunity for that from a remote standpoint? And would that even help? And what is that? I don't even know how that would work, but is, I mean, you know, is that even if it's like wrangle, I don't even know how it works remotely, but just a thought I know in person that was, you know, it was always helpful when there were parent volunteers. Yeah. Right. Nope. That's a great point. Yeah. I'm not sure how to figure that out yet, but right. it is definitely a good thing. <laughs> it is. Definitely. Yeah. Even if it's those sight words or. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, presumably for those younger kids that are remote, they probably have a parent who's there and available. Um, so I don't know, just a thought for some of those bigger classes, maybe right. yeah. little pullouts or something. Sure. Great. And now we have Amy Crichton with us and Amy's going, we're going to talk a little bit about our cases that we have had that we haven't had to send a close contact notification home to because of the way that we were strategic about when we left for December break and how we had those four days remote prior to December break and where we are now. Um, so we'll have that conversation. Um, Amy's done a lot of calculating and <clears throat> communicating with the CDC and I'll turn it over to Amy. Right. So um, I didn't really know how to start until uh, about a week or so ago and to kind of just look at the numbers that we had before we left and kind of go through to where we are now. So I looked at the numbers of the number of COVID cases that we had in the state of Maine and kind of correlated it to what that meant for us in school. And that was the best way I could kind of frame the picture. So on a week to week basis, um, leading up to through December, so like the week starting uh, November 30th, then the next week, December 7th, the week after that, December 14th, the cases in the state of Maine went from a, an average of 290 cases per day to 364 cases a day to about 424 cases per day. And what we saw in school, uh, each one of those weeks, for some reason, each week we saw about eight cases in our schools. Uh, not every one of those cases affected us um, in means of having to do contact tracing. About three cases per week in those three weeks, we had to put in the work to do three separate sets each week of contact tracing, notifying the families and moving cohorts to remote learning. Uh, then we paused for break um, the week of December 21st the state daily average was about 434 cases. 
The week after that, December 28th, 522 cases per day. And then this week so far, we've had three days worth of data, according to the CDC website, uh, we're up to 554 cases per day-ish. So venturing into uncharted territory, uh, we haven't had the case rates this high in Maine before. And what that's gonna mean for us in school is certainly an increase of cases in our schools and us being able to keep up with the amount of cases that are in school while infectious. And that is when we have to look at close contacts in the classrooms, on the buses and such, and move those classes remote again. And as we move through that, we've done that before, it'll just come down to, you know, if we're moving three teams in the middle school remote, then we need to look at staffing. Is it advisable to just take a break for the whole school? take a pause, let cases settle, rejoin. Um, that's just something we're gonna be taking on a database basis, I think. So Amy, if we had been in school over, I don't know, how many weeks did you just sort of gave us four, what, um, four to five weeks of yeah. rolling numbers, something like that. So say that had been like January, February, and we had been in school, would like off the top of your head, like, would we have had to go remote? Was that enough? Um, would those have added up to enough cases that we would have had to switch to remote? Do you, do you, I'm sort of looking for like a, your general gut answer, not like. Well, the, the, the numbers that I gave you, um, the daily averages where we're in the 200s, 300s, then we crept up to the 400s. We were in school during those times. And that's when we would see about eight cases per week. And depending okay. on if those kids were in school during the two days prior to their infectious period is when we would have to take action. And we maintained with those, you know, 10 or so cases per week. It just so happens that three of those were the ones that knocked a team or a class out of school. Um, and we're about, we're over a hundred more cases per day in the state of Maine than we were then. So clearly it's going to mean more for us and take it day by day. And when we hit that threshold, where in any one of our schools where I think we, you know, like I said, if we're moving two, three, four classes out of a building, then do we have enough adults in that building to staff? Can we maintain cleaning or should we just take a pause? in one building and two buildings and three in all of them. That's, that's, it's like I said, uncharted, uncharted territory. So um, I, that's all I had to go by was the numbers, what we had and what they are now to give us a little bit of a forecast of the unknown, I would say. So, and Denise, I think the numbers, and I think what you're asking is of those folks that you know of over break, Amy, mm. uh, there were quite a few, I don't know what the breakdown is between students and staff off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would, it, it would have been, it, I, we don't have a good answer. It's, it's going to just, it would really have depended on infectious time frame. So like, and school, where they were in the school. Yeah. So it's, okay. it's one of those, it's, it's kind of hard to say, yep. We would have like had to shut down the schools. We're really, it, it's every single time is a little bit different. Right. And we were made aware of several cases that happened while we were on break. Um, family, staff did reach out. It wasn't as much as I would have anticipated. I think that not everybody did reach out, which is fine. We were on break. Um, so I don't know. And I don't feel like I have an accurate idea of what happened to our people while we were out. Hmm. The CDC, um, Amy, correct me, correct me or clarify, help clarify for this. But 
when we first started in September, it, it was pretty clear to us that the CDC was going to say, you're at three cases, you close a building or you close a wing, or um, they have really looked at everything on a case by case basis and have re has, they've recently deferred to the school district itself to say, we're gonna, we, we can stay open. We can, we have enough staff we can work through this piece this way and we can stay open. So they've changed their model since September mm -hmm. uh, sure. to, to put it more on the school district. Right. Yeah. When we first started this, we um, were going by the, the three case rule, three cases in a school, not related, like not siblings, PCR positive tests, and you're considered an outbreak, boom, you close the school, you clean, you do your thing, and now that's not the case. Outbreak status, outbreak investigation status, just they monitor, mm -hmm. they make sure that we're following all the guidelines, cleaning's being done, and we have enough staffing to stay open. Yeah, I think staffing is the key, and when we did meet in the last time with, regarding an outbreak, um, it was very clear, and I think we said this at the last board meeting, the CDC is like kids are safer in school instead of out in the community. I don't know, you know, I understand, like if this is the time probably to talk a little bit about how um, the public input from Jen and from Jenica, their concerns about coming back as teachers into the schools, um, I don't know that there's any good answer about it, except that we feel like our kids are better off being in school for education purposes. But there's like, we just don't have that crystal ball. Do we have any idea when the teachers, when educators are going to start getting uh, vaccinated? Oh, I, well, I don't know, Amy, do you know, do you, have you heard? I've heard that um, educate like uh, school staff would be in the phase two of Maine's four phase approach. That's too. Yeah. Um, when that is due to happen, I'm not quite sure. Um, so uh, I'll touch on that just quickly. I can tell you that in phase one A, we're still actively doing it. Uh, they're projecting phase one B will be end of January, beginning of February. So okay. we're in that one B. Phase 1B yeah. is people age 75 and older and frontline essential workers, but it I don't know exactly which. Like, yeah, I think teachers classified. are in 1C, which is other essential workers. Well, I thought we were in 1B. Okay. Okay. But that's the last I looked, but you know what? I think they've actually shifted some things too. So they have. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the, I'm actually reading something yeah. from the legislature. So they are <coughs> yeah, their teachers and support staff. Be, you know, the recommendation from the CDC is that they be considered frontline essential workers. So you're right. Maybe if they move that around, who knows? But but um, Travis, do you know any? You said timeline was end of January for 1B? Right. So the 1B that includes us, like we're in the middle of doing our EMS providers right now. And then the next step is the regular firefighters and other uh, essential staff within our department. Those are being projected to be hopefully the end of January, beginning of February. I don't know when the teachers get involved in that aspect, but I know they're starting that 1B, their hope is to start that 1B process around that time. Mm. Yep, it's still pretty, un I think it's unclear. But at least it sounds like teachers and support staff are considered a priority in some level. <laughs> uh, do we have the rapid test uh, ability yet in our schools? Yeah, we're still working on that. We haven't received them yet from the state. And Any that frame on when they're expected, they should be shipping soon. I put the order in, and the idea behind that is to have them available for students or staff who become ill during the day. Um, say a student comes to us 
with the runny nose, a cough and a fever um, right around lunchtime. And it's going to be a child that we send home anyways, because they're clearly, you know, full of symptoms. We would get permission from the parent to use the rapid test and we would be able to do it then. It then is suggested that it gets followed up with a PCR test within 48 hours to confirm. But we'll, what this will do for us as a school is to be able to get a jump start on the contact tracing right there in the day when it happens, if we get a positive result. Um, yeah, also, I was just gonna add, that's, that's if it's a positive result, but you just did that as I was getting ready to. Right, mm -hmm. right. And I will add, that um, I was under the impression that we were going to be allotted 30% of the number of tests um, according to our student population, and it is actually 10%. So in essence, each school is going to be getting a box of 40. Oh. Yeah. yeah, to start, we can order more. Um, and so this is a situation where we really, you know, want to be putting them to use as it, they have been um, intended for illnesses that happen during the school day, not a, uh, we don't want parents to send their kids to school. Let's just go to the nurse, see if you got a test. Like if you're sick, still please do the pre-screening tool, keep your child at home, call your provider. Um, it's not intended to be a screening, a screening tool. Sure. Amy, did you just say a box per school or per district? Per school, a box of 40 per for school. each one of our schools. Yep. Yeah. I had originally put in the order for the 30% and then I got a phone call saying, how many, how big's your district? I thought it was big, but no, you're only allowed 10%. I was like, oh no. Hmm. <clears throat> I just saw, I just looked up some other stuff and I did see that teachers are still in 1B at this point in time. Uh -huh. So, and, it, and it's what um, Travis said, end of January, beginning of February. <clears throat> can, I, can I make a recommendation to you guys as I'm trying to deal with it on my end here is to start the process now of asking the staff whether yep. they want to get it or not. Yep. Because it'll like help you and, and make yeah. speed the process up in the long run. Otherwise, you're in a time crunch and fight. Right. We've, already, we've already yeah. put it up there to staff, yeah. um, at least in terms of like a survey. Yeah, I mean, is do is there? Um, I mean, this is maybe a conversation for another time. But last year, this we went or two years ago, whenever it was, we went through that whole thing about mandatory vaccinations. And at some point, I would like to have a conversation about does this fall into that whole conversation? And did was that kicked down the road anyway? I can't really remember how it all ended up, but. <clears throat> like a weird short timeline anyway. And I feel like it was supposed to be the beginning of this year, but anyway, it's just, it, I'd be interested to know, does this become a mandatory vaccination down the road? Um, That's unknown. I mean, that would have to get passed in a law. Yeah. And that would take time. And yeah. I'm not quite sure where that Let's is. Put it this way, Denise, it's not something that we're going to say MSAD 60 has to have a mandatory vaccination. Yeah, Unless, it's got to come from a much higher realm. No, no, no. I, what yeah. I knew. I was curious yeah. to, you know, thinking ahead, how that might. Right. Well, I, I do know that staff are thinking about that and are questioning that, and um, reasonably so. And we've been we've been basically saying we're not looking at mandating anything. This is something that we would recommend, right, as an educator uh, or a or a support staff member, but. Um, mandates get dicey so yeah yeah just to add to that our attendance this week just to to put that out there our staff attendance has been 98 and 99 every day and our student the range for our students k-12 to has been uh 92 percent was the lowest 99 percent attendance was the highest and again, that was K-12. What was the staff again? The staff was 99 and 98 percent. Okay. okay. Hmm. Thank you. And, and we know Amy has had some calls from school nurses who have the building nurses who've heard from families 
So we do have um, some record of students. And as Amy said, we're not 100% sure we've had all of them because we were on break. And if it didn't impact um, schools, they may not have let us know. Um, right. And I know I just wanted to clarify too what it means for a positive case to be counted towards our school. And by the CDC standards, if the person became positive or symptomatic, but they were not in school 14 days prior to those two events happening, then they don't get counted as a number towards our school. So they were not in school during their exposure period is what that is. So that happened uh, several times over break um, because we ended a little bit early that their positive result or their symptoms began 14 days after that they had been in our building. Audra, is there an appropriate time for us to ask the question of whether there's a recommendation to stay remote for another week? No time like the present. Would this be that time? <laughs> that would be that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can certainly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's my question is whether, um, whether you guys, I, I can't tell if you're making that recommendation or not. <laughs> Our recommendation is to go as planned on Monday. Okay. And if that's the case, then um, as of now, only individuals would have to be out. So we, other than that busing situation, all buildings and, and classrooms could be back as normal. Right. As of right now. You all know how I feel about this. Um, I, we had 4,000 deaths in the country yesterday the highest yet. I know that we have a good system in place, but it might be wise to give it another week just to see how this plays out. Because if we are at the beginning of another spike, which we could very well be, it's not just our students who are putting at risk, it's the staff and all the families. I mean, we're hearing from teachers who have concerns valid ones we did last week as well last time as well um i know it's important for the children to be in school and there's no substitute for that these are extraordinary times and they're not over yet um and i really urge the consideration of giving it another week in remote I mean, yeah, any other discussion from the board? I think that, you know, there's, once again, we have a lot of and <laughs> stuff to consider. Yeah, go ahead. I think I think what we're doing is working. And I think as long as our families are respectful and understand to do the pre-screen and not send your kids in to risk everybody else, I think we should start school back up on Monday. I agree with so, Rob, with Joanne, and I and I think we should follow the recommendation of our superintendent. Um, I, I that I was kind of looking at a calendar and um, thinking just ahead, which doesn't doesn't address this current time, but wondering if when it comes to the February vacation, we might also do something like you know, a buffer period, the same as we did at Thanksgiving and Christmas to sort of try to deal with any travel or, um, you know, just a buffer period of remote around um, that February vacation. Again, that's not, that doesn't address this, but um, it, I'm trying to look at sort of the, the weeks ahead and, you know, see if we can get through a number of weeks and then if things are starting to kind of pick up then we've got, at least got another like scheduled block um of time that we know there can be a reset i don't know that's i don't again i don't know that that helps right now but it's it's gonna come sooner rather than later 
I I would agree that we go to school next week. I I must say I I've, I've been very impressed with parents who have been right on top of it, notifying the school and all that stuff. I was afraid we were going to have to chase parents down if they we heard a rumor or something that somebody was sick. And you know, as long you know, it's up to the parents to send them or not. You know, they they have to go with what they feel, and they seem to be checking their kids. So. I say that we go forward, you know. <clears throat> this is hard. There's no easy answer. Mm. Um, I, you know, I, I all along have felt like um, we need to be going by the data that we have for our district. And um, I do feel like, you know, I guess it was pre Thanksgiving when Audra and Sue, you guys made that recommendation on really, really short notice, which I think to me tells me that you guys aren't afraid to do that if it, if we get to that point. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I it's <laughs> it seems miserable out there, but um, I you know I, I can't help but think that we we have a system in place that allows us to go remote with literally a day's notice if we need to, and um, you know, so we might get back to school on Monday and then Tuesday have to go remote, and I do not like that idea at all. But if the numbers right now support going back, then then I would support that. Any other thoughts from the rest of the board? Um, I, I would say one thing that um, like assisted living and older people are getting vaccinated right now. Um, my mother-in-law is getting vaccinated next week. She's in an assisted living place. They are really, um, they are rolling this stuff out pretty quickly to, um, you know, well, as Travis said, to like essential workers, but also to the most vulnerable populations. So that doesn't, it doesn't, change a lot of things, but it does change a lot of things. So um, I, that, I think this, the speed, I know it's not going as fast as people had hoped, but I'm pretty impressed with, um, you know, we have some family in assisted living and, I'm, and I've been very impressed with how quickly they're getting things moving. And um, so I do think that there's a lot of positive momentum, even though there's obviously a huge increase in cases. I think, um, I mean, looking at what Amy put together for numbers, it makes me a little nervous generally what we could be looking at, but um, with all the precautions and I think if communication is the same, you guys have been really good about getting us the emails or, or doing the text or everything. And as long as if something comes up and it's just like, it, it's quick and it's, it's. Um, I just think we might might be able to look at school-wide um, shutdowns of buildings, as long as that's open and we're all looking at the numbers, I'm okay with trying to go for Monday as well. And I appreciate the way the communication has been. Um, I think that's been really good. Any other input? I mean, I will say to, you know, to Jen and Jenica and anybody else who is, didn't write in, but has the same concerns, um, you know, they're being heard. <laughs> um, it's hard. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is if people are, I mean, parents still have the choice, like the ones who have chosen to send their kids to school, if they're personally nervous about it, I mean, I know it's not, good to not have their child go in, but if they are 
really worried. They always have that choice to keep their kids home for a short period while they wait and see what's happening. You know, if they're on that edge of, of being very, you know, worried about this. Well, they do have that option if we can make it work size wise for those classrooms. But I mean, that is there. I mean, you guys are taking that on a case by case basis, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, my understanding is that at, at least at the high school level, I know it's easier for them to switch, um, but my understanding is that the new technology has made a difference in the quality of um, that those classrooms that are split remote and in person. Thank you, Chris Russo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, what about the other? Um, where's our? I guess that, I guess that was just the first of those bullets. <laughs> um, or we did special ed. So school nutrition. All school. All we were going to talk about for school nutrition was just the two um, donations at this point okay. in time. So we've covered that. And then under athletics, we are, last week, we were designated as yellow for York County. So athletics cannot participate in person. So we're continuing to use our our model of the coaches checking in with the, the teams and the, the students and setting goals for their daily routines. So we'll continue that. We're not um, getting a reading this Friday, tomorrow. We're getting it the following week. Uh, so we're going to remain status quo for athletics until that next reading. And if it comes in as yellow, we're going to um, continue doing what we're doing. And just to clarify um, from the letter that we got, um, yeah. kids that are remote are eligible to participate. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yes. And then we talked about attendance. So those were the um, bullets under the educational programming. And then the next item is the employment. employment. And we don't have any new hires, retirements, or resignations at this time. Yay. <laughs> and then, then your new item to add bus monitors. Or, so this started uh, last year. I think it was last year. Denise is is nodding her head, Van Camp, and thank you. And um, the bus monitors have um, approached a couple of different of the our unions to join at, uh, the union. So it came to the support staff contract, and so the work was done probably in the spring through the summer to now uh, to look at that contract and create an addendum for the bus monitors. So there's a few things that um, have have come up and the bus the contract has been voted on that this is these are good to put into the contract. That's why I'm bringing it up to you to summarize what those parts are so that you will um, hopefully agree to that and then we can sign off on that. So um, the additions that are we are looking at to include for the bus monitors are adding six holidays. So they've had they've had no um, they haven't been a part of any contract. So it's adding six holidays, um, and then the other thing would be adding six sick days. And with the earned paid leave, uh, they would have received that as well as part of what went into effect in January. So those are the two monetary pieces uh, that have impact right now. Some of the other things that are added is uh, the recognition of monitors in the contract, the rights of work for notification of the job, their, um, their assignment, their hours, um, the seniority, the rotation of seniority and the RIFs, 
and how the reduction in force is handled and how a recall procedure is handled. So those are some of the nuts and bolts. And then um, there's no impact to insurance at this point in time, but when the contract gets reopened for negotiations um, for the 21-22 school year, that's when we will have the discussion about um, adding insurance benefits for the bus monitors. So that's the summary of those changes. Well, I think we're talking about seven individuals. Yes. That's it. So it's not a lot of people. <clears throat> Is that something that we need to vote on? Yes. Yeah, we just need to vote to say that it's okay. Okay. To add them to the contract. Yes. Um, it's Joanne. I'll make a motion to... Um, add those uh, additions to the um, support staff contract. I'll second, I'll second that. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I usually don't have my mute, mute off quick enough. I'll second it. Uh, second. Me either. <laughs> uh, any questions or discussion on that before we? Vote? I just want to say that I'm really glad to see that they have been recognized and they're being added to the contract. I think it's long overdue. Yeah. Agreed. Is there a um, is there any kind of pathway or interest from bus monitors to become drivers? Yep. Yep. And that's one of the things that Brenda like works with monitors. A lot of times we'll get somebody in who doesn't have the credentials to be a driver yet, but she can get them started on the monitor route. And then if they're interested in driving, not everybody's interested in driving, to be honest with you. Cause it's a big old bus, um, but we still need, we need special ed monitors. We need, you know, folks to work on those special ed runs and stuff. So, um, but definitely the first thing Brenda does is, do you want to get a CDL? We yeah. can help you. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. That's great. Um, any other, any other questions or discussion on that? All right. Do we want to all in favor? I support it. Okay. Thank you guys for getting that done. Mm -hmm. And then any other, I think, Audra, did you say there was going to be another? No? I have yeah. another. The donations were going to be other, but we okay. Okay. I have one. Um, I, family health situations are such that um, my term is up this year and I'm not going to be running for a second term. I'm, the, the, the meat in a generational sandwich here, and I'm going both directions. Uh, three elderlies and a young adult who's got continuing health problems, and I'm just stretched too thin. So That's a lot, Estrita. It's a lot to yeah. take on. Yeah. That so, makes me sad, though. I appreciate you. Yeah. Wait, so is this the end of your third year? Yeah, it yeah. is. Wow. Yeah. It goes by fast. It does. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I know that that's, that is a lot. And then I thought about it a long time and I, and I decided I would wait until after the holidays to really, you know, yes or no, take a real assessment, a realistic assessment. And then things have been getting worse on certain family fronts. So it's like, all right, writing's on the wall. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, is anybody else's term up this year? Oh, Joanne. Mine and is up and I'm undecided. Again. You'll be running again, Joanne? Okay. No, no. Are you I'm Wait a minute. That's not, no, you can't. You can't. I think, I think I've, I've, someone else can have a turn. But it's uh, just been wonderful. I've really, really enjoyed it. But I'm ready to move on to other adventures. Being yeah. a grand. Yes, I love that. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, Travis, did you just say that you're undecided? My term is up and I'm undecided at this time. Wow. That's a lot of turnover. Yeah. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah. The board the way it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, okay. So no, that's it for others. And I guess we just need a motion to adjourn. Uh, do we need to, if we're going into another executive session, do we have to do that now? Or so I don't think we need it, right? Because you were able to cover both of those within one. So you guys were efficient and good. Oh, excellent. Um, 
<laughs> All right. Adjourn. This is Joanne. I'll make a motion to adjourn. One second. I'll second it. I'm Nancy. Well, Lynn, thank God your cat finally showed up. I've been waiting for a visit this whole time. <laughs> All in favor? We're pretty. All right. All in favor. All right. Oh, oh, sorry. one other question. Are we back to every other week for meetings? I, I think we can be. Yeah. If it works for y'all. Unless I guess you'll just you guys was well you know next if if craziness happens we will be calling a board meeting. Okay. 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 Maybe next week we can just get an email update on